It's great to be back at Asia Society, which uh, was one of my first job experiences when I was much, much younger, 20 years ago. Um, I would also like to thank Rahul Bhavnani and the India Center Foundation for being great friends and partners uh, and outreach partners for this event. Thank you for that. And it's also nice to see some old friends who are here. So I hope to catch up with a lot of you after the program. Um, you know, there was a lot in the news yesterday, in the U.S. news, about President Trump deciding that he's going to go to the World Economic Forum this year. It's the first time a U.S. president uh, has gone to the World Economic Forum in 20 years, at least that's what the headlines tell us. In the Indian press, there's been a parallel story underway, which is that Prime Minister Narendra Modi has decided to go to the World Economic Forum this year, and it's the first time an Indian prime minister has gone since 1997. Huh. So it's pretty much the exact parallel. Uh, to me, this speaks to India's ambitions on the global stage. India has, at previous World Economic Forums, taken large delegations headed by cabinet ministers. But this year is going to be a little bit different. My guess, uh, and I'm not sure if the ambassador will weigh in on this, we may never know the truth, but my guess is that last year's appearance by Chinese President Xi Jinping probably made something of a splash and probably factored into the decision uh, for India to send its head of government to that forum this year. I say this as an anecdote to illustrate what I think we're seeing happening with India now on the global stage. And I think Bobby will also be able to, to speak more about some of the contemporary challenges and issues that India is facing domestically, uh, which are all true. Uh, but what you see happening on the world stage is now in India that is stepping up in a more active way. The Indian government has defined a new term for the type of global leader it would like to be. There is a new term that, to my mind, has not been used in this way before, uh, leading power. Uh, not a global power, not a great power, but a leading power. What does this mean? Um, the way India's foreign secretary has discussed this concept, he has given a number of speeches about this. He's talked about India having, in the past, reacted to world events, but maybe it's time to start thinking about shaping global events as they unfold and not just reacting to them. And I think that's what you're seeing happening now with India. This raises questions for global governance. We can talk about that as a, a kind of one track of issues. What does that mean in a world in which India is not a member of some of the major uh, global coordinating institutions. The UN Security Council is among them. India is not a permanent member and has sought permanent membership for some time. India's previous government uh, under the Congress-led uh, UPA government uh, launched, uh, in, in effect, a global campaign with three other partners, uh, Japan, Brazil, uh, and Germany, to try to seek that uh, permanent membership in the Security Council that powers that are now larger global economies, that are playing a more important coordinating role in international diplomacy, in helping to solve global crises, but find themselves without that voice in one of the institutions that matters the most. You could look at economic institutions and make the same observation. Take APEC. You have one of Asia's largest economies, and it's not a member of APEC. Now, that's been a, a, an issue that the Asia Society Policy Institute has looked at in some detail, and I think it's an important one to consider. Um, some of these issues about India's stepping up on the world stage uh, are economic in focus. Some of them are also about rising military power and the way India is thinking about its role militarily. Um, the Indian Navy has a declared ambition for primacy across the Indian Ocean. India thinks of its space in the region, uh, increasingly describing its role across the Indian Ocean as a net provider of regional security. And you hear that echoed in the way uh, U.S. Secretaries of Defense and Secretaries of State talk about India and its role, a net provider of regional security. So I think this starts to paint a portrait of a country that's now playing a little bit different role than it was 15 years ago and one in which it's playing a more active role, playing a, a, a more participatory role with other countries in the process of thinking about global challenges and what those solutions should be. It's not true in every case. I can talk about some of those cases where India has elected not to join, for example, uh, the Global Coalition Against mm -hmm. ISIL. That's one, one example. <clears throat> Um, but I think you are starting to see more instances in which uh, India is ready to stand up and say, this is our position, this is what we'd like to be uh, uh, debating with the global community, uh, and our view is our voice should be heard. 
Um, I'll just stop there because I was asked to do mm -hmm. two, three minutes. Yeah. Um, but I'd be happy to talk about any any of the elements here. And in fact, there are a lot of other directions we could take on this uh, conversation. Well, that's great. It's a lot to chew on already, Alyssa. Thank you. Um, Bobby, some uh, opening thoughts from you, the year ahead. Sure. I'll, I'll focus much more uh, on, on specifically on the year ahead. Um, I, I see 2018 essentially as a as a run up to the big uh, show in 2019. Uh, the government, uh, the BJP government of Prime Minister Narendra Modi, uh, will come up against its big test in 2019 with the general election. Um, it is looking fairly positive for uh, the party, um, primarily because the opposition has not been able to muster any kind of a, uh, a response to the shellacking they got uh, four years ago. Um, but there are a number of uh, things that will happen in the course of 2018 that I think will have a major impact on, on the general election. Um, so I'm going to split this up into, into three categories. Uh, very briefly, in, in politics, there are going to be eight local state elections across the country uh, this year, and, and it's a pretty decent distribution. There are a bunch of them in the northeast, uh, one or two in the middle of the country, one in the south. Um, and these will give us a sense of the tone and tenor of the election next year. Um, the Gujarat state election, which took place in December, that is the Prime Minister's home state, um, gave me a couple of reasons to be to be worried. Uh, the tone of that election uh, was significantly different from all the other local elections that have gone before in the last four years. Uh, it seemed to me that for the first time, the conversation from the ruling party was less about development, about economic progress, and more about the sort of somewhat old-fashioned uh, um, uh, dog whistling about uh, religion, uh, some some rather low blows from the prime minister himself, which uh, was unexpected, uh, in which he indirectly suggested that his predecessor, uh, Manmohan Singh, was in cahoots with the Pakistani ambassador, which is frankly ridiculous. But it suggests that the BJP feels a little anxious about its electoral prospects. And we will see across this year whether that anxiety deepens, whether the conversation returns to development economics, or whether it, it goes continues to go down this this dark hole of sectarian politics and and um, and dog whistling to to specific constituencies. So that's something I'll be keeping a close eye on. In economics, the, the slowdown of the eco economy, even though India is still one of the fastest growing economies, certainly the fastest growing large economy in the world, the slowdown is significant. We're no longer talking in the sevens, we're talking in the sixes uh, in terms of percentage growth. And that might seem like a big number coming from the US, but India has been used to growing at a, at a much faster pace. And, the, and sort of every percentage point uh, slower has an enormous impact on, a, on hundreds of, on at least tens, possibly hundreds of millions of people. Um, coming just before the big general election, this slowdown uh, and its impact, particularly on unemployment, uh, will have a, a significant political fallout. And how the government manages that, just this morning, the, they've announced a raft of new reforms, uh, some of which um, were, were all of which are long necessary, uh, some of which will be controversial, including allowing uh, foreign companies into the retail sector in a way that would directly affect Indian retailers, who are a, quite a strong um, political force in the BJP. Um, so that there's going to be the intersection of economics and politics is going to be very interesting to watch in 2018. Um, in foreign policy, this is, this is a year, I think, where some of India's <clears throat> long uh, uh, held fantasies have come true but now India has to live with the outcome of, of that truth uh, the, 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 um, the President Trump's decision to, to stop um, uh, American aid to Pakistan is something that India has, has long wished for, long argued for both quietly and uh, stridently in public. Now that has come to pass I think um, now there has to be recognition that although that is an important symbolic gesture, it in no ways reduces Pakistan's ability to make trouble for, for India. And in some ways, it might actually free Pakistan from whatever shackles the US was able to impose. 
Um, it is already pretty clear that, that China uh, will step up uh, to, to fill the, the vacuum uh, with Pakistan left behind by the U.S., at least on the, in, in terms of military and to some degree economic support. Um, and Saudi Arabia and, and other Arab states have, have already, over several years now, been greatly increasing their aid to Pakistan, which means that the $2 billion, which is the sort of maximum uh, impact possible of uh, U.S. Um, aid being taken off, that $2 billion will not make a big dent in Pakistan's ability uh, to function. Um, so it might be that India discovers this year that this was all primarily a symbolic thing. Um, so that's something to what, to, that bears watching. And then China uh, is, has shown in the, in the past couple of years that uh, it, it has a policy of sort of needling India, especially along the borders. Um, and I think that will probably continue when the winter is over. I think when the snows have melted in, uh, in May and June, we'll find uh, that there are other uh, border issues like the one we saw play out in Doklam last year. Um, so those are the three categories, politics, economics, and foreign policy that I, I'll be watching very closely. Um, I'll, I'll throw one in uh, as a fourth, uh, in part because I've just returned from Delhi, um, and that is Delhi itself, and more specifically, Delhi's pollution. Um, I see Delhi's pollution and its ability or inability to deal with it as a, as a kind of forgive the pun, but a canary in a coal mine. Um, right now, any canaries in Delhi are dying. Um, the, it is a major, major crisis. The, uh, the pollution levels in Delhi are off the scales, and it is a test for uh, administration. It is a test for politics. It is a test for uh, the society in Delhi to be able to come together and do something about it. And so far, it has been a signal failure. Um, you have two or three different political parties that are involved in the, in the, in the multiple state and local governments and central government. Um, these parties don't, you know, the, the, the Delhi state is run by the Aam Admi Party, which does not get along with the uh, BJP, which runs the central government. And the neighboring government of, of Punjab, is, uh, which contributes to the pollution in Delhi, uh, is the Congress Party. And so you have three different parties who don't get along, who are constantly at daggers uh, at each other, and they have to figure out a way to come together to solve a problem. And you cannot sweep Delhi's uh, pollution under the carpet. Um, and the, 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 the ability of these parties and these governments to work together to solve the problem in Delhi, I think, would be a great test for uh, whether or not India can deal with some of its other bigger pressing problems. Thank you, Bobby. And <clears throat> this probably goes without saying, but it's such a stark contrast, right, with the with the Chinese situation, where I mean, who knows where that's going to go? But uh, a government in China that decides it wants to deal with the pollution will probably deal with the pollution, right? Whereas, and, and the daggers are not uh, so apparent. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to come to um, a quick question for each of you, and then since uh, uh, we have a busy room and, and an online audience, as I said, we'll we'll come to the room. Uh, back to a good news, uh, a little piece of good news from India that I, I thought was not only good news but also really interesting, and I'm going to ask because it might not surface otherwise. So an, an excerpt, right, from your book, this thing about the car industry, um, was published in The Atlantic the other day that I just thought was really interesting. That uh, Obviously, make in India is a big, uh, has been a mantra for uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi and, uh, and will continue to be so, but uh, I don't know that most people have a clue as to the status of uh, a huge piece of, of make in India, which is car manufacturing and how well it's going and the fact, by the way, that just stood out in my mind that they're about to, to match the levels of production in South Korea. Can you say a few words about both what's going on in that sector and, and some of the broader, you know, the implications of that? Uh, for the country. Sure, absolutely. <clears throat> Thanks for uh, mentioning the Atlantic piece, yeah. uh, which also just went up last Thursday, so it's still fresh. Uh, I, I think if you were to ask most Americans, let's say we're doing a random survey of Americans, and you ask them to list, let's say, the world's top 10 auto manufacturers, I'm pretty sure that India wouldn't make that list. Um, and I think that perception issue is one that is now belied by what we've seen happening. Um, I, I didn't include the export story in that brief adaptation, but it turns out that something like a third of small cars in the world are manufactured in India. I mean, that's an incredible mm. statistic and quite a surprise, actually, if you're not thinking about it. I think we're used to thinking of the major auto powers as 
course, the United States. China, of course, now is the huge one. China, the United States, Japan, Germany, Mexico, South Korea. Um, and India is now among them. That's a, a slice of good news in a larger story about the Indian need to do better in its manufacturing sector. Um, the context for this is the fact that Indian growth has been on a pattern that is very different from the way other countries have developed. It's uh, had a lot of growth coming from the services sector. Um, traditionally, the East Asian and Southeast Asian economies have been able to grow and develop by having manufacturing sector successes that provide a large number of jobs, um, entry-level jobs that, that also create employment. That, of course, has been the path out of poverty for China. India has not done that well in the manufacturing sector. Mm -hmm. um, the garment industry is a case in point, and I talk about the garment textiles in my book. It turns out that actually India uh, exports fewer ready-made garments than Bangladesh a country which is about one-sixth the size of India. And this has to do with uh, labor laws that prevent factories from growing to a size of over 100 employees. Uh, it has to do with issues of land acquisition. It's you know, the sort of environment for creating scale that can allow manufacturing to become globally competitive. That's been challenging in India. The current Indian government has a program that, that, in fact, has a slogan attached to it, which is Make in India. Uh, the Make in India plan actually is pretty much the same plan that the previous Indian government had put together. Um, so you can see, actually, if you go back and look at the uh, policy documents on this issue, successive Indian governments have been very concerned about the need to develop uh, a better environment and a stronger manufacturing sector for precisely this reason. Um, so you've got a great news story in the audience sector, which suggests that if you can get something right, this could be a good news story. Now, what I also talk about, and I think what the world doesn't know, is what this means. Is there a window in which it's possible for India to uh, expand its manu manufacturing sector and create jobs before the challenge of automation kicks in more fully, before the challenge of let's say additive manufacturing, which is going to change the way supply chains are set up. Um, there are a lot of technological changes on the horizon. Um, experts who look at this issue suggest that right now there's probably a 10 to 20 year window for India to be able to uh, really unleash the possibility of manufacturing for its economy and for its employment creation before these kind of larger global challenges that are challenges for the United States, that are challenges for Europe, that are challenges for all of Asia uh, kick in and have an impact on India as well. Um, but I did think that the auto example is illustrative uh, mm -hmm. where they have had managed to have some success and success on a global scale. So don't let anybody tell you that Indian manufacturing can't be competitive. In fact, it can be. Indian parts manufacturers are supplying the global auto manufacturers. Um, Sundaram Fasteners was one of the first uh, to supply General Motors on a global scale. I mean, this, this is possible, achievable. Uh, so it's an issue of getting it done. Mm -hmm. And speaking of getting things done, I think it's worth mentioning, we, we haven't touched on this, that uh, I think while we were sleeping, the World Bank came out with a fresh report. So although the numbers you cited looking uh, in the rearview mirror have been going down, I think they're saying back up to 7.3 is their forecast for, for 18 and 19. Yeah, it's, and it's interesting. The World Bank says that the Indian government has just, just sort of scaled yeah. back its yeah. own yeah. ambition, yeah. Uh, which yeah. is sort of interesting. So uh, the World Bank is more optimistic about India than, than India. In India, to be. okay. That's which interesting, is, too. I suppose uh, it's better than the alternative. Right, 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 right. Question for you, Bobby. We've, uh, uh, it, you, you talked about the, you know, vulnerability, probably not that great for Prime Minister Modi in a, in a year's time. It's interesting. I mean, I think he had, fair to say, a, an air of invincibility uh, and has for, for much of his term. It's also interesting that we've gotten through both of your excellent opening remarks, and I don't think either of you mentioned the word demonetization. Oh, yes. Now, we've talked a lot here at different events um, uh, about India and, and, and its economy, and of course that's, that's at the center of the discussion, or has been for a year or so now. Um, there was a guy quoted, um, I don't remember where, it may have been in The Economist, a Gujarati voter in the in advance of the elections who said, uh, uh, highlighting what demonetization had meant for his small business, uh, I think the quote was, Mr. Modi hurt our business, we're going to go and vote, we're going to hurt him too. Mm. To what extent do you see a, a link between the demonetization and some of the issues <coughs> the party has had, 
or and, and if not, then what are the other things that may be pulling them from that air of invincibility a little bit? Well, with demonetization, if, if demonetization was going to hurt uh, the BJP, Gujarat would be the place where that right. would happen. Uh, it, is a, it is a state, the, the stereotype in India of Gujaratis is that they are the, they are the petty bourgeois small businesses, um, and those are the businesses that, was, that were most sort of obviously hurt by the combination of demonetization and the new GST. Um, and so the, the, the Congress and the other opposition parties were hoping there would be a demonetization dividend for them mm -hmm. in the Gujarat election. The fact that the BJP was able to win mm. uh, despite that, perhaps to some degree because of some of that dog whistle politics I was talking about, um, suggests that they may have sort of, the, they may have the, the worst impact of demonetization on the politics may now be behind them. Um, I think most economists who look closely at the numbers, the, the most positive spin that they can put on it is that the demonetization was a wash, that it, mm -hmm. didn't, it didn't achieve the things that the government set out, uh, which is to, to, to eliminate black money. It hasn't. To uh, eliminate counterfeiting, well, that makes no sense ever. Um, to to uh, encourage digital uh, transactions, to some degree that's worked, although as cash has become more and more uh, available in the market, dig digital transactions have gone down. But the most positive sort of spin that you can put on demonetization is now, um, nearly a year, a year later, a year and a couple of months later, it's a wash. Mm -hmm. um, and that may be true politically, but it, it does, it has left a, a, an impression of the government's poor management of it. Mm -hmm. Um, this is the government managing a decision it made and the outcome of uh, the outcomes which were fairly predictable. Right. If it made such a hash of managing this, mm. how will it manage an external shock, a, a, a crisis that was not of its own making? Mm. Uh, the one that, uh, that's worth keeping an eye on is oil prices. India's uh, e economy has been strong in the past, a little weaker than before, but still quite strong quite substantially on the ba back of Dividend very, very world. low oil prices worldwide. If this friction, growing friction between Saudi and uh, Iran were to continue to, to escalate and we have, heaven forbid, an event that leads to um, a spike in oil prices, that would be a, a real test of India's economic management and the ability uh, of India to deal with this sort of an external shock. To some degree, the, the BJP has been fortunate uh, in the way that the previous government was not. The previous government had to live with the outcome of the 2008-2009 the global uh, meltdown. Uh, this government has not had to deal with a crisis of that nature. Uh, if one presents itself this year or early into the new year, that would have an enormous impact right. on the politics. Great. So um, uh, this room is stocked with people who know much more about India than your moderator does this morning. So I invite you all uh, to join the conversation now. Uh, there are microphones around the table, and we have staff with mics at the back. Um, if you can keep it relatively brief and tell us who you are, that would be great. And if you want to direct it to one of our panelists in particular. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alyssa. Thank you for a very thoughtful presentation. Uh, Alyssa, I, uh, sorry, Bal Das from BGD Holdings. Uh, I'm curious over the last 20 years as you've been covering India on the issue of woman and girl child, and I'm looking forward to reading your book very much. I read the excerpt at the Wall Street Journal the other day, oh, very well written you. one. Uh, have we, has India made, what kind of progress has it been making if you take the metrics of nutrition, healthcare, education, in uh, bringing the woman and the girl child issue into the forefront of economic development oriented uh, thinking. I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. So my book is really focused uh, about uh, on India's role globally. And to the extent that I uh, look at these kinds of statistics, I look at the, the case of something that has surprised people, ec economists and sociologists, that uh, the female labor force participation rate in India has been declining. And that emerged with uh, an, an international labor organization study that came out in, I think, late 2011. Uh, and I think created pause for people. I mean, he here is a country where there are known barriers for women, uh, but it is also a country where you have seen women, you know, heads of investment banks in a way that you don't see in the United States. 
Um, but the idea that women's participation rate in the labor force had been on the decline has been a surprise. Now, I think some economists have been looking at this issue since then to try to determine explanations. There have been some explanations, for example, that as, as incomes rise, maybe families decide they don't need a, a dual household income. Uh, maybe the wife decides to stay home. I don't know the complete explanation. Um, but this is an issue. Why? Uh, because Having equality in labor force participation can actually lead to higher GDP growth. Um, McKinsey did a study, I think, in 2015, and they estimated that if India had the, the best in region scenario, um, gosh, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it would be something like like huge uh, impact a huge GDP, impact on the GDP. I think yeah, yeah. it was some like. I don't want to misquote it, but I, I believe it was something like a 67% increase. Um, and if I'm wrong on that number, it's because I didn't write it down for this <laughs> moment. But please take a look at this McKinsey study because it's quite interesting. Uh, so for a country that is looking to have that higher GDP growth, finding a way to encourage getting women back in the workforce and ensuring that there aren't barriers to their doing so can be a big boost. Um, I'll also note that on that count, what has been very interesting to see in the kind of uh, uh, global um, international financial conversation, you've seen uh, the IMF take this up as a macro issue, uh, whereas they didn't used to talk about uh, women's labor force participation as a kind of issue for uh, economic stability and economic growth. So that's something that's been very interesting. I, I don't know the answers on nutrition uh, and early childhood girls education. Um, maybe Bobby has looked at this more closely than I have. No, I, 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 can't on, sorry, I can't honestly say I have, but I will sort of under, underline the point that Alyssa is making, which is a, uh, an economy where women, it's not just the, the rate of participation is dropping, but there's some studies that suggest women are dropping out of the workplace. Mm -hmm. Th those who are already working are, are dropping out. That is very alarming. That, that needs a much closer examination. Do we know why uh, that is? I mean, well, there's been all kinds of uh, very facile uh, suggestions that have been made, none of which by itself holds up to me anyway. Um, one Alyssa mentioned, which is that as, uh, as men's salaries have gone up more and more, either men are, are compelling their wives not to go to work or women are, their wives are making the decision that since there's more money coming in, we, can, we don't need to go to work. That A suggests that women were working under some kind of sufferance, which, is, which sounds to me like it's nonsense. And secondly, it doesn't take into account the fact that prices have gone up. So yes, salaries, salaries have gone up, but prices have also gone up. So the pressure on families has not greatly declined. That's one uh, explanation that doesn't really hold much water. Another that has been suggested in this, again, seems very silly is that uh, as the availability of domestic labor has shrunk, um, the, the wives, again, it's only about wives. It's somehow these explanations don't talk about uh, uh, single women, uh, but that as uh, the availability, particularly in the big city of domestic labor, uh, domestic helpers has shrunk, uh, the wives have had to mm. give up their jobs to take up the burdens of running the household and, and, and raising the children in a way that previously they were able to uh, offload some of that responsibility mm -hmm. onto uh, domestic uh, help. Again, that, that doesn't really... Adam, there's not a satisfactory explanation, but this is a serious problem. An economy where women are dropping out of the workplace uh, at such a level is an economy that's in trouble. Uh, Robin Meredith, author of a book called The Elephant and the Dragon and at J.P. Morgan. So very nice to see you. Um, could I ask you each a question? Uh, Alyssa, can you bring us up to speed on U.S.-India military cooperation to the extent there is some? I remember some naval cooperation, especially in the Gulf area in the past. I don't know if that's continuing. Love to hear, especially with China's Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and Bobby, I've just could you update us on Modi's broad-scale economic programs. He came in saying he's the great guy to get India's economy going again. It's, in fact, slowed down, not sped up. You know, uh, we can skip monetization. I think we've covered that one. But, you know, what what is his plan for developing the economy going forward? Do you want me to start on sure. So uh, the U.S.-India defense relationship is one of the great leading edge aspects of the overall bilateral relationship. It is going very, very well. Uh, I think it, that would surprise many people who uh, had 
been familiar with U.S. India defense relations 20 years ago, non-existent. Uh, so that's been a great good news story. You've seen that progress um, over the course of the past three U.S. administrations. The Trump administration is carrying this forward in a big way. Um, at the tail end of the Obama administration, um, codified then into law, the U.S. Congress passed uh, a special uh, label for what India could be for the United States. They called India, this is now a formal category, a major defense partner. This matters because of the way U.S. defense technology exports work. Uh, in, you know, arms sales, certain kinds of technology can only be exported to uh, U.S. allies, our NATO allies. We have a category called major non-NATO ally. Some people may know that Pakistan is one of those. Um, so to, to not have any status can, can oftentimes make it harder to, to, to have some of mm -hmm. these uh, defense platform agreements. And this major defense partner puts India on a par with our closest partners and allies. So that's very important. Um, you've seen the whole range of exercises increase. India now exercises more with the United States than with any other partner. And the talking point on the U.S. side is that the United States exercises more with India than any other non-NATO partner. So of course our NATO allies are still the closest. Uh, but India is getting up there. What I do think you've seen that is a tremendous change and that's affecting the way people are thinking about the strategic future uh, is uh, what has been going on in East and Southeast Asia with China, and there is a shared concern with the United States and India that the sea lane should remain open. India, like the United States, has been a vocal advocate for freedom of navigation. Uh, India does want to ensure that the Indian Ocean remains a, a free and open space for commerce for its own navy. The United States and India are both uh, very focused on this issue. Um, what you have seen now in the last four or five months is an increasing convergence uh, where the Trump administration has picked up uh, what the Indian government, the Japanese government, and the Australian government talk about, uh, a concept of the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, in the United States, we have <coughs> traditionally talked about the Asia-Pacific. Um, the Australians and the Japanese and, and the Indian leaders talk about a, a broader Indian Ocean region, an Indo-Pacific. The United States is now using that same mm -hmm. term. And what that does is it expands the field of reference. It places India in a much more central role. It acknowledges the fact that India is a major defense partner in this larger region and that the United States and India will continue to partner closely. Um, there are a number of ongoing defense partnership initiatives, including something called the DTTI, the Defense Technology and Trade Initiative, that's focused on uh, co-development and co-production of new platforms. Um, some very sophisticated. There's a, a working group on aircraft carrier technology. Um, you know, it's very ambitious. Uh, you would not have seen this 15 years ago. So I, I do think that this is something to be aware of. Uh, I'm not sure people are focused on the fact that India is now a very, very important defense partner for the United States. India doesn't you know, deploy its troops on some of our ventures in places, so, so we don't think of India in that way. But where we do have shared uh, interests, particularly in the Indian Ocean, it's very much an important partner. Yeah. Well, question just, number two, just yeah, the, uh, just going to add uh, one one uh, point to that, and then I'll come to you. Which is that for India, this this represents a great opportunity, but then there's also a new challenge of balancing uh, the U.S. and Russia. Um, Russia is far and away the most important defense partner that India has had. Most of India's hardware um, and a lot of its software comes from Russia, um, not compatible with American systems. Um, how does India manage that relationship? There's a larger question of how India manages the U.S.-Russia uh, relationship as well. So far, it's done a very good job. So far, India has managed uh, to uh, to have its cake and eat it too, uh, to some degree, um, especially given sort of Russia's a sense of kind of ownership, if you like, of the India relationship. Uh, this is mm -hmm. quite remarkable. It's a it's a it's a management uh, feat that for which you have to give the government credit. Um, as far as Modi's economic uh, agenda, I think going into the next year and a half, into the next general election, it's only got to be about jobs. 
jobs, 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 jobs. Um, the the uh, the jobs crisis is real. It's a it's a very young country, and you have vast numbers of people, young people, who are coming into the workplace with no jobs. Um, all kinds of statistics sort of uh, pop uh, pop up uh, every week. Forty percent of people with MBA degrees uh, have no jobs, um, and that's the, the the top of the ladder. Um, you know, India needs. Two million jobs uh, uh, to produce, create two million jobs. Uh, one million a month. One million a month, and it's producing fifty thousand a month. You know, the, into that circle, that square will not go. Mm. Um, and a lot of those young uh, Indians are uh, form the core of Modi's support base. Um, he, he has a strong connection with young Indians in a way that. Ironically, Rahul Gandhi, who's a lot younger than he is, just simply has failed to uh, create that connection. So the expectation of those of young India from Modi is is far higher than that of their parents, uh, and managing that expectation is going to be a big challenge. The, how is he going to do it? Well, there, there's a big investment push in infra infrastructure, which is the traditional, if you like, the old Congress Party style of job creation: mm -hmm. build some roads and and put people to work. Well, those the, the MBAs are not going to work on the roads, and uh, I think. A lot of, and that's just at the top of the tree, going farther down the, the, the education chain, uh, there's an expectation from young Indians that their jobs will involve sitting behind a desk in a nice air-conditioned room uh, working the telephones. Um, the, the infrastructure jobs are not necessarily the ones that will satisfy this cohort of people. Um, manufacturing is a is a is in, in some parts of the manufacturing uh, economy. There's been there've been a few bright sparks, automotives being one of them, but that's not enough to deal with the, the sheer numbers that's required. Uh, another place where you have a challenge, and which for India in the last couple of decades has been a, a, a bright spot, is in the IT sector and in the, uh, the the business processes, the sort of call center jobs. A lot of those jobs are going away. Uh, to to new competitors, the Philippines and others, uh, and that is something. That, that at least you know the job creation there has flattened in some categories. It's coming down. Uh, that's a that's a real challenge for the for the government. How do you how do you fix that? Um, infrastructure investment has a, a, a kind of trickle down effect, but it. I doubt between now and, and the general election in the summer of 2019 we'll see that trickle down actually happen to the extent that it it uh, creates those millions of jobs that it'll be that'll be necessary so how uh, the prime minister and how the party how the government manages the expectations of this this vast cohort of young people who who are coming in in the expectations of jobs coming into an economy that uh, where they need the income quite desperately as prices go up uh, that's going to be the big challenge I have a question how we take Two here, and then we. I promise we'll get to the back of the room. Daniel, yeah. yeah. Hi, and we Daniel. Stick to one question, sure. Robin. You got a freebie. <laughs> well, I'm actually going to pick up from Robin's question, your response to it, Daniel Moss Bloomberg view. The term Indo-Pacific, mm -hmm. as opposed to Asia-Pacific. Mm -hmm. Asia-Pacific always had at least an implicit economic underpinning, as well as a strategic thing, because of the role of Japan, China, Taiwan, the supply chains. Is there an economic underpinning to the Indo-Pacific concept, and is that a flaw in that? The Indo-Pacific concept, as presently framed, is a strategic concept. Could it have an economic underpinning? It could if institutions reformed to better include India in such a way that, that, uh, uh, that India was part of uh, this span. Um, APEC f foremost among them. Now, um, is that a flaw in the concept? Not necessarily, if you're thinking about what it means to uh, uh, be looking at the broader set of strategic interests across this large expanse. When you look at the expanse of the ocean and, and think about strategic needs, uh, it's maritime. It's very different than thinking about uh, land defensive needs. So in a sense, having that as a framework orients India to thinking of itself as a maritime power. Um, that is actually another transformation that's happened within India. I think uh, writers like uh, C. Rajamohan of Carnegie India have written extensively about this. For a long time, India thought of itself as a land power, um, but it is now increasingly thinking of itself as a maritime power and is uh, plussing up its navy to meet that challenge 
India is one of the world's largest defense modernization processes going on. Um, it's not moving as quickly as its own ambitions would have it move. Of course, that happens all the time in defense, and India is no different. Um, but India uh, is now thinking about itself and uh, defending the seas. In fact, if you look at um, uh, the most recent, the, the, uh, the, the naval uh, strategic concept uh, platform that was issued, there's a transformation of the way the Indian Navy talks about the seas, from using the seas to securing the seas. Mm -hmm. This whole idea of India now playing a role protecting freedom of navigation as opposed to uh, these just being sea lanes that the Indian Navy uses. I think that's actually quite important. So, so it's, it's an important concept for this reason, for the change in India's own thinking about what its role is in the region, and for how that is linking India to its own larger ambitions with its partners, with Japan, with the United States, with Australia, which, by the way, is the Quad. Sir? <coughs> Ken Wasserman, I'm an attorney. <coughs> to what extent are there significant attempts within India to develop more cooperation with Pakistan? And if so, where are those attempts focused? <laughs> Um, I think early on in uh, in this government's life, there was there were some fairly good faith uh, attempts. Uh, Prime Minister Modi himself uh, visited Pakistan almost impromptu, uh, extended what he would consider the hand of friendship, uh, and there was some early uh, promise that on the other side, Nawaz Sharif seemed interested in in moving uh, a discussion forward. But it, it, it appears that the Pakistani military establishment put the kibosh on that, and that's gone nowhere. Um, there's always talk of track two, track three, track 17, I don't know what, diplomacy that takes place behind the scenes. I've never seen any real positive outcome of that or any real man strong, reliable manifestation of that. Um, from where I, I sat at the Hindustan Times, my sense of it was that there was no progress taking place there at all. There, there was a sense that India had sort of basically written off its expectations of Pakistan under the current Pakistani political uh, uh, situation. Um, and they were waiting to see if they would be. Now, the, 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 on the security side, the two national security advisors just had a meeting, always good when they're talking, uh, rather than sort of hurling insults at each other. Um, will that actually yield any, anything on the ground? We'll have to see. Um, this is a good time to talk. It's the winter. The snows have, uh, have blocked all the passes uh, in Kashmir. This is a good time to talk. But typically these conversations sort of uh, uh, peter out when May and June come along and then you go back to the, the old status quo. So I'm, I, I don't think there's any real movement there. There's some hope, I think, if the, uh, the, the, the Trump decision to, to uh, suspend aid to Pakistan, if that shakes some trees there, and it, it forces Pakistan to come to a reckoning with itself and, and change its postures. But I think that is, that is, at the moment, pure fantasy. I promised one in the back. I can't. Yes, the woman there. We have a microphone. Leslie Pelty Guzman with Rapid and Energy. How does India think about its energy security and energy diplomacy? The government wants to make India maybe a more gas based economy, but domestic production is not really increasing and the pipeline from Iran to Pakistan is not happening. So it means maybe becoming more reliant on LNG imports from Qatar, Australia, the US, Russia. So how does India think about its um, um, security issues, energy, and geopolitics? Uh, let me Have we got a chapter in here on that? I, I, I talk about um, climate and, and India's energy diplomacy. Vavi might want to answer that from a domestic perspective. I'm not sure. Um, but I think, what, first of all, um, uh, India ha has signed contracts, two contracts, I believe, that have been approved for LNG export from the United States to India. And that's been a big good news story of the past five or six years. It's the first time that's happened. Um, we have a, an elaborate process in the United States where non-FTA partners can't automatically receive LNG exports. There has to go through a whole permissions process through the Department of Energy. So those have been completed. Um, I, and I believe one of the first shipments uh, went out last year. Um, watching India in the uh, climate multilateral negotiations we saw a fascinating transformation, and this is something that I touch on in the book. I think many people in the climate diplomacy world had begun to think that 
it would not be possible to achieve a global climate agreement uh, with India because India was not willing to make any concessions that would allow a kind of global agreement to come together. And that, that conversation changed with the, the Paris summit in 2015. And you saw a very different posture where India came to Paris, said, you know what, we need to have an agreement. We're not doing this because the world is pressuring us. We're not doing this because President Obama says we have to. We need to leave the world in good shape for the next generations of Indians. Um, India has launched, uh, along with the French government, something called an International Solar Alliance. It is based in India. Uh, it is designed to help increase both uh, the prominence, the deployment, and the financing networks available to increase the use of solar energy. Um, and that is a, a very powerful form of India's energy diplomacy, where it's taken the lead on ramping up solar and saying this is something that can benefit the world. India, like China, has one of the world's largest solar energy ramp-ups going on right now. Um, India has, has long had a solar mission. The previous Indian government uh, created a national solar mission, and then the new government, the Modi government, uh, increased its uh, uh, ambitions for the rollout of solar energy and wind energy capacity. And they've taken that as, as part of their diplomacy. I mean. The ambassador probably agrees with me. I mean, this has been a big piece of part of what India is now doing as a global actor on the climate front. Yeah, I think I, if I just step in there, that so solar and, and non-conventional sources have got a very, very big push under this government, especially solar. And, there, and although it may not be on the scale as, uh, of China, there's, there's a lot to be uh, optimistic about. Um, on the on the more conventional energy uh, sources, so uh, petroleum as well as gas, um, just as India in in the defense realm is trying to balance its relationship with the U.S. and Russia, um, India is also trying to balance its relationship with Iran and the Arab coalition, if you like. And it's not a coincidence that a lot of uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, diplomatic initiatives in the past year have been directed at that space. Um, the, he has been uh, on, a, on a very sort of conspicuously shoring up India's relations with uh, the Arab states, with the Emirates, with Saudi, with um, with Qatar. Um, and it's a, it's a, he has, he's got to thread two different needles there. On the one hand, there is uh, Saudi and the Arab coalition against Iran. And then there's also within the Arab coalition, Qatar against Saudi. Um, and India needs to have relationships with all these parties in order to secure its, uh, its supplies of, of energy. Um, and, and I think there's a, there's a whole bunch of uh, people coming to the uh, the Republic Day um, ceremony. That's usually a good sign of where the Prime Minister is putting his efforts, who he's inviting to join him on the podium at the Republic Day uh, parades. Um, and there's, there's a reason why there are so many Arab leaders there. Uh, this he has annoyed the Iranians a little bit in the process. The Iranians, uh, it's quite instructive that, they, that uh, Khamenei, uh, um, about, I think, September, October last year, began to refer to, to Kashmir here in his uh, uh, sort of weekly sermons, which is a departure, because traditionally Iran has sort of kept its hands out or kept its its mouth out of the Kashmir issue. But the fact that Khamenei has begun to, to drop the Kashmir uh, issue into some of his discussions is quite interesting. Uh, I was in India when that happened, and it set off a little frisson of, of excitement and, and anxiety in the in foreign policy circles there. Um, so it, it tells you that there there is a little bit of damage limitation that needs to be done. Um, but that's that's just the indication of the, the more complex landscape that India faces right now. Ambassador Luxon from the Philippines. I'm sorry, sir. Yes. Just, uh, on this question of energy, I think one story which is not uh, very well known is that India is power surplus now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, f till a few years back, uh, industry faced power problems. So today, India is exporting power to neighboring states of Bangladesh and Nepal. And out of the around 600,000 villages, in India, less than 3,000 are now not connected to the grid. Wow. And by the end of the year, all villages in India will be connected to the grid. I think that's an incredible achievement that we have achieved uh, in the last few years. I think that's on one story which uh, is not known and not told. And the government is working very hard to even change the composition of the, of the, of the power mix and uh, not only solar and, uh, and uh, wind, but also nuclear power. So I think uh, we are going towards a more healthy mix. And uh, this is an incredible achievement, which will then 
help in our making India program because earlier industry faced this problem of power shortages. Right. I think that that's now in the past. Yeah, great. Thank you for sharing that. And Ambassador Luxin. Um, further to the issue uh, raised by the gentleman across the, uh, across the room, um, the, uh, what they call the Indo-Pacific underpinnings I think don't exist at all and they are nowhere compatible to those of the Asia-Pacific relationship with Western economies. I think the, the focus, the United States focus on, 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 on an Indian uh, military alliance or relationship is uh, really a distraction for the Chinese. They remain the main concern of, of the Western powers and the Southeast Asian countries. Um, the Indian Ocean is just too big a neck to choke, so the, the real problem really remains the Straits and the South China Sea. The, it, whenever it's raised about the possibility of uh, Japan, Australia, India, um, military uh, combination to, to counter the Chinese uh, concern, um, the usual reaction, for, say, from the Philippines and the others is resentment. We do not want to get involved in any quarrel with China that involves India. That is a mortal enemy. It's hard enough to get involved, as we should get involved with Japan because of the old, you know, historic grievances, but to get connected to India is really asking for trouble from China. Now, we don't want Chinese incursion, but we also don't want Chinese, you know, anger. So I don't think that matters. But um, just on a, on a light note, for those who are concerned about um, um, the U.S. President's uh, <clears throat> impulsiveness and uh, ability to focus and follow up, I must tell you that in this uh, uh, ASEAN summit, it was observed that he sat down uh, between the Vietnamese per, uh, leader and, and Modi and uh, perfunctorily greeted the Vietnamese leader, turned to Modi and that's it, monopolize the conversation. He says, what's this all about? And um, the effect of that is two things. One is that apparently he and Modi may show up at the World Economic Forum, so that's something, so he does follow up. And, um, <laughs> and uh, the, the, the stoppage of aid to Pakistan, maybe, uh, he does follow up on that, or if, it's, if it was an impulsive personal attraction to Modi, which is, which is very, by the way, very prominent in the ASEAN, uh, summit, um, it, it also shows that uh, if it's not that, then he does listen to state, uh, state department policy experts. Uh, so, and, 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 and personal, if uh, my president, by the way, shows up in Republic Day, that's the other aspect. The personal element in these contacts among leaders is really strong. I mean, Philippines is not a military power by any means, but the personality of the, of the new president very strong, to put it mildly, um, just got them all together. Uh, he was uh, talking with the Chinese, and, uh, almost on a basis of equality. So I, I think it remains a sideshow, the, um, the Indian alliance. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I think we have time for one more. You've had your hand up for a long time. I'll give it to you if we can keep the question and answer as short as possible. That'd be great. Um, except for um, the, a few remarks that Bobby made about the Gujarat election, we've spoken very little about some more distressing trends in India in the last three years. Uh, the crackdown on civil liberties, on civil society, and the growing concentration of executive power. So I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about that. Um, the expansion of solar energy electrification is very important, and those are sort of hard infrastructural capacities. But when you think about India um, and what it's known for, of course, internationally, it's this long democratic history, which is sort of unparalleled. So how do you see those developments taking place, given that there's been a great difficulty in creating jobs, uh, that growth is slowing down. We do see an authoritarian sort of populist shift. This is not just in India, it's across many other countries. And how does that relate to India's growing ambitions to become a leading power? Yeah, I, I mean, we're, we're talking in the, in the context of, of this year, uh, and I think we'll see more of the same. There's, there's no reason to suspect, there's no reason to be optimistic that there will be a, 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 a a reversal of uh, the the patterns that uh, that you allude to, alluded to. If anything, there'll be uh, an acceleration. If the government is anxious about uh, the the political landscape, then I think the 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 tendency to try and manage the message, to control the message, will only uh, become more pronounced. Um, but India does have uh, in in some in some spaces. Um, a, uh, the ability to fight back. Uh, there are, um, you do see
the uh, media organizations, perhaps not in the mainstream, but in the sort of emer emerging digital landscape, you're seeing uh, media houses uh, take the fight back to the government. Um, and because they're in the digital space, because they're shall we say, a susceptibility to, to pressure is, is lower, they are able to fight back. Um, the most distressing thing that's taken place in the couple, last couple of days is the, is the attempt by the government to, to muzzle this, uh, this journalist who uh, doing basic journalism 101 with no apparent political agenda discovered a, a great gap, a great sort of yawning flaw in the middle of the, uh, the Aadhaar scheme, the personal ID scheme. Uh, the fact that the government's response has been to try and, and take that journalist to court and that newspaper uh, to court rather than to fix the problem is uh, is, a, is a sort of alarming sign. Um, so yeah, that, that's why I'm watching these these state elections very closely. If the results, it's it's the BJP is, does not sort of always behave as you would expect a traditional political organization to do so. Um, at some level, logic suggests, just sort of rational logic suggests that a party that is uh, safely and quite strongly ensconced in power would ease up on uh, some of its, uh, some of these uh, tendencies. But that's not what happened. I think after a big election victory in Uttar Pradesh last year, uh, when the government should have felt incredibly confident, it in fact sort of increased the pressure on its critics. Uh, if that's how it responds to a strong election victory, how is it going to re respond to a very narrow, sort of just squeaked past election victory in Gujarat and the possibility that it might not win all the elections in, uh, in 2018? That's something that I'm certainly very alarmed about. I'll okay. just offer a, a brief thought. Uh, you know, on the world stage, India does not promote democracy. It doesn't believe in promoting democracy. And I, I write about this at some length in the book because it has a very different concept of what it means to be a democratic power. Um, what it does do is some technical training. It supports the community of democracies. It supports the UN Democracy Fund. But I think Indian leaders view democracy promotion as having you know, unseemly regime change veneers to it. And so they don't like a lot of what the United States does on that front. Having said that, what has been India's calling card on the question of democracy is its own ability to stand as a model for democratic governance, for tolerance, for what a multi-ethnic, multilingual, multi-religious democracy can achieve. It has also been the case that India has you know, not seeing the growth rates that China has. So oftentimes people look at it and say, well, what, what does this mean? Does it mean that a democracy can't achieve the kinds of economic transformation that a more authoritarian country can? I've never met a person in India who would sacrifice democracy, uh, but it's also the case that the ability to stand as that model, uh, as a source of inspiration for the world, does depend on r retaining that kind of strong uh, democratic uh, uh, institutions within its own country. Thank you, Alyssa. I'm sorry we're going to have to cut it there. I don't know if either Bobby and Alyssa can stick around for a little bit more. I know there are more questions. Um, quick note, I mentioned all these other events coming up uh, on the 6th of February, uh, which is a Tuesday. Uh, we will gather for the next episode in this uh, Asia Briefing series. Uh, we are, um, uh, that'll be Trump and Asia one year in. Uh, oh. This institution did a lot of work uh, in terms of recommendations, policy suggestions, etc. Uh, for the new administration a year ago, and uh, we had a lot of events here between uh, the election and the inauguration, and we thought we'd take a look back and see, uh, first of all, uh, w which of any of those prescriptions have been followed and uh, what's happened since, and more important, where we see things going, and that'll be led by uh, the leaders of the Policy Institute here, uh, Danny Russell, who served as Assistant Secretary for East Asia and the Pacific for President Obama, and Wendy Cutler, who uh, um, was Deputy U.S. Trade Representative, deeply involved in, in the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the Korea-U.S. Trade Agreement, among others. That's February the 6th. Um, I should say also support for uh, the, the series comes in large measure from the Nicholas Platt Endowment for Public Policy Programs, named for our former president. And uh, mostly I just want to thank you all for being here to thank uh, our great uh, panelists. We've covered security, the economy, business, pollution, human rights, a lot else. And, women. Uh, women. I told you they'd be great, and they have been. <laughs> and uh, one more reminder that uh, 
uh, Alyssa's uh, book, Our Time Has Come, is uh, uh, available at the back. And thank you, Sanjeev. Yes, Sanjeev, by the way, who I learned, my colleague here, Alyssa Ayers uh, also hired Sanjeev Suchan, which is <laughs> for which I can't thank you enough. So, um, I'm so happy it worked out so well. <laughs> yeah. So Alyssa will be signing books at the back. Thank you all, and see you next time.